Good morning, everyone. Before we start things off, are there any non-bronies in the audience? Like a friend? Okay, so one, two, three. Okay. I don't know what your friend did to drag you here, <laughs> but I promise you, you might have a more fun time here than them. Oh, and now the bronies are panicking. What is he going to do? All right, all right, all right. So. Don't, no problems, don't worry guys, you, gotta get, you guys are gonna get plenty of My Little Pony action to satisfy your, your, your pony bloodlust, like, ah, I need pony stuff. Oh, God. Okay, so, well, welcome to Sound is Magic, a look into the sound design and sound history of My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic. My name is Victor Frost. I'm a radio production major, major at the Mike Kerb College of Arts, Media, and Communication at California State University, Northridge. On top of being a student, I have worked at 88.5 KCSN. I've worked for big organizations like MIT, Langer Labs, uh, Putnam Investments, I've, uh, and those have been as audio engineer. If I forget to mention that, I'm a professional audio engineer, so this is sort of my forte. Uh, I've also worked for small uh, organizations like podcasts and indie game devs. Uh, in the Brony community, I've worked with most of the big name actors and actresses in here. I've worked with uh, Rena Chan, uh, uh, Filsterman, I've worked with uh, Brie Faith uh, and uh, Bald Dumbo Rat. Uh, let's see, I've done a few covers, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> this day, Aria, yes, someone remembered, oh my god. <laughs> And I help, and a lot of times though, I help bronies out with questions regarding audio engineering, helping with their voice acting direction, things like that. I'm involved in a couple of projects in that respect right now. Um, but before I start with the lecture proper, I, I kind of need to say something. Um, last year, uh, I walked onto this exact stage, actually, and uh, I did my very first panel. It was this panel. And it started me off on a year-long, at, at least at this point, year-long adventure of um, going to conventions and doing panels and entertaining, and I think to a greater respect, um, teaching people about subjects going from My Little Pony and sound design, of course, to other topics that I'm, I'm so passionate about, like cars and, and vehicle dynamics and, and you know so many other subjects. And I just feel so damn privileged and grateful to be able to come back on this stage to be able to do the lecture that started it all one more time. So thank you all for that. So what is sound design? Well, because it is such a broad field, let me start by telling you what we won't be covering. We will not be talking about voice acting. Uh, in fact, we won't be talking about recording at all. In most cases, sound design happens before uh, sounds uh, blah, blah, blah. sound design happens before and after the recording process, while writing the script and in post production. Strictly speaking, it is the process of specifying, acquiring, manipulating, and generating audio samples. And it's used in a variety of media establishments, including television, film, video games, and theater. So how is this going to work? Well, first I'm going to talk a little history. Uh, then we're going to talk sound effects. We're going to get into fidelity and diegesis, which is going to be fun. And by the end of this lecture, you will know at least one diegesis joke. Uh, we'll cover music and its effect on the narrative. And finally, if there's time, I'll do a little Q&A, which you'll be able to, you know, yell questions from the crowd and just uh, you know, ask me if, if we have time. Big if, big if. Because last year, uh, that gentleman in the top hat there was so generous enough to extend the time for me to be able to answer your questions. So let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> but I would not dare impinge upon him that, uh, that courtesy again because it, it messes up this con schedule and God help me if I do that. So what does this have to do with anime? So let me answer the burning question burning in the hearts of all you ultra-hardcore otakus and weeaboos out there, because this, even though you guys are ostensibly a crowd of bronies, this is an anime convention after all. So, well, let's be honest here with our little fanboy selves, Japan did not invent animation. The French did. 
In fact, the first Japanese animation sound, Chikara to Onna no Yo no Naka, uh, came out in 1933, five years after Paul Terry's Dinner Time and Disney's Steamboat Willie. Both were among the first cartoons with synchronized sound. And I bring up Disney for a reason. See, modern anime traces its roots back to Toei Animation. This is the same company that brought you stuff like Dragon Ball, Sailor Moon, Galaxy Express 3.9, and tons of other mainstay anime classics, as well as some of the more modern stuff you might be familiar with. The first their first film, which is Tale of the White Serpent, was released in 1958 and strongly echoed the animation and sound design style of Disney Productions at that time. This wasn't just a coincidence either. They straight up said, we want to be the Disney of the East, which is a tremendous undertaking, considering even by that point, Disney was a very firmly established anime pro uh, animation production house. I think that's K-On. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, so, so there's my requisite bit to make this relevant to this convention. Uh, let's, now let's come back over the Pacific, back home to here in California. Uh, most of you know that My Little Pony Friendship is Magic was spearheaded by Lauren Faust. And she, right, our favorite redheaded writer. Uh, and she worked on the Powerpuff Girls and Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends, which were, became tremendously popular. Who she brought with her to the My Little Pony production team was a slew of animators and writers who have worked on shows recognizable to all but perhaps the youngest of us. I'm talking Samurai Jack, Dexter, <laughs> Dexter's Lab, and of course, the Powerpuff Girls. So why is this important? Well, two words. Well, one hyphenated word. Hanna-Barbera. Yeah. <laughs> Much of the crew for My Little Pony has a history with the studio. And it's no surprise, you wanna talk cartooning giants? Hanna-Barbera was the biggest. Well, <laughs> except for Disney and Warner Brothers. And for a while, MGM and Fleischer Animations. Look, the point is, the point is that everyone has seen or has at least heard of at least one Hanna-Barbera cartoon. Their cartoons are ingrained in our society. Shows like The Flintstones, The Jetsons, Yogi Bear, Scooby-Doo, The Smurfs, which is getting a second movie, what? <laughs> Hong Kong Fooey, which is also getting a movie? What? Yeah, Eddie Murphy. And yes, Dexter's Lab and the Powerpuff Girls. Hanna-Barbera Studios, Hanna Studios was around from 1957 to 2001. And in that time, obviously they did a lot. But what they did that was most relevant to this lecture right now is probably the most used, most recognizable, but generally under-recognized and under-appreciated underappreciated contributions to the world of the cinema television arts. This is the Hanna-Barbera Sound Effect Library. You may be familiar with some of these sounds. <laughs> You're wooing for that? <laughs> these are all sounds pulled directly from the Hanna-Barbera Sound Effect Library. And if you grew up watching cartoons on Saturday mornings, during the 80s, the 90s, or even today, you have no doubt heard these sounds or variants of them. And why not? Generations of cartoonists and sound designers grew up watching cartoons with all of these sounds. They grew up watching Hanna-Barbera works. And since the 1960s, other studios began using these sounds too. Nickelodeon used them, Disney used them, Warner Brothers used them. No wonder we know these sounds so well. These days, though, most studios use digitally recorded variants of these classic sound effects. But they're still here, they're still with us. So why don't we break apart this scene and see what we find? Why are you hanging out in a ditch? Because Pinkie Pie predicted it! Honestly, Spike, she did not. Two coincidences in a row like this may be unlikely, but it's still easier to believe than twitchy tales that predict the future. <gasps> twitchy tale? Thank you, Saints. <laughs> 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 
So this scene uses variations of three primary effects. Uh, the slide whistle, the wobble saw, and stretching rubber. We hear the wobble saw when Twilight wiggles her tail and when AJ rears up. We hear the stretch of rubber when AJ pulls her hat on tighter. And we hear the slide whistle when Twilight pops up out of the ditch. These same sounds are heard all throughout the series. And once you start listening for them, you'll be surprised how often they appear. Now, I told you we get into diegesis, and here we are. I, I have to explain it to you now because, frankly, we can't go any further unless we do. If you forgive me, I want to take a picture of this crowd, and I just realized the camera was there. So, <laughs> we really can't go any further unless we do. It's really, really that important. So, I want you all to engage your imaginations with me for a moment and pretend that this, all of this, you sitting here, me giving this lecture, this entire convention is part of a movie. Not a documentary, though, a, a work of fiction. Uh, the words that are coming out of my mouth, the sounds coming from the speakers are all something called diegetic. They exist within the context of this fictional world. However, if I start giving... <sighs> you know, I, I've done this lecture four times now, and every time I do it, this, that bit seems to go flatter and flatter. You know what? I think I'm just gonna, just gonna go away now. Have your attention up front here. Yeah, hi there. <laughs> yeah, preparation. So, what you just saw was the effect non diegetic music can have on a narrative. See, if I just walked off the stage, you know, all sad and, you know, ugh, it would have been awkward, not, you know, funny or sad. But because I had that music going on, you know, the Hulk walking away song. Because I had that music in there, the music enhanced the emotional impact of the scene and directed it into what I had intended, which was, you know, sad and maybe a little funny if you recognize the music. Also, it made the staff about 100% less nervous because, what the heck, the panel has just walked off the stage in a sad fit. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, so, am I back on stage yet? Yeah? yeah? yeah. Great. Back to you, real me. Thank you, virtual me. <laughs> a lot better than a stupid voiceover for a bit of music, isn't it? <laughs> ah. So you might be asking, why is diegesis so important now? Well, because sometimes sound effects can dip into the non-diegetic particularly when a show is trying to communicate a character's internal emotional state. For example, let's take a look at this scene from season one. Thank you all so much for coming. It means so much to Gummy. Could I have some more punch? Well, of course you can have some more punch, Mr. Turner. This is one great party. You really outdone yourself. Why, thank you, Rocky. I'm having a delightful time as well. I'm so glad, Sir Lancelot. My dad got my half of a little slice of cake. Anything for you, Madame LaFlower. I'm just glad none of them ponies showed up. Oh, they're not so bad. <laughs> oh, 
Now, as funny as it is, this is a very emotionally charged and complex scene with action taking place more so internally than externally. But how do they express this without, you know, doing this stuff other than, for example, derping their eyes? <laughs> well, a fiddle draw is used to indicate Pinky's transition from sane, well, sane as Pinky is, <laughs> to insane during her psychotic break. In that same scene, we hear sounds of strings snapping and springs uncoiling that correspond with her very concerning twitches, letting us know that bit by bit, her psyche is coming undone. On a somewhat lighter note, uh, the audience is treated to the song of a heavenly chorus when young Rarity discovers a massive cache of rare gems embedded inside of a large rock in this scene. Of course, non-diegetic sound effects can be used for comedic effects as well. When Twilight adjusts her fake beard after getting the royal canterlot voice from Luna, it makes a creaking sound. In the same episode, uh, <laughs> in the same episode, we get five non-diegetic sound effects used in relatively quick succession during Luna's voice lessons. How was this? Perfect, lesson over. <laughs> A little quieter, princess. How is this? Better, right, Fluttershy? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what we heard was the classic zip effect when Fluttershy ran away, a bell when she slammed into the door, which some people have uh, contested that perhaps that is diegetic, but we've heard the bell on the other side of Fluttershy's door, so I'm shutting you guys down now. It sounds nothing like that. Uh, a su cartoony suction cup and cuckoo birds when she peeled her face off, and some squeaking sounds while she slid down the door. Of course, in episode 17 of season one, we hear the sound of a squeaky toy after Fluttershy brags about being the world champ at shh. Yeah. Game. A game? It's called Shh. What's that? Well, it's a game about who can be quiet the longest. Sound fun? I'm the world champ, you know. I bet you can't beat me. Oh, <gasps> uh, I kind of wish you guys hadn't wooed at that point because you, you missed the extra sound there of the stretching rubber when she, her cheeks inflated. Aww. Although, although, with regards to that, that adorable little squeak, considering how downright adorable she is, that sound might just be diegetic, which you guys understand now. Yes. Okay, so Friendship is Magic utilizes a whole host of diegetic and non-diegetic effects to enhance the quality of the show through sound. An important aspect of this is the upkeep of fidelity. Now, fidelity is how a sound we hear matches up to our expectations of the sound. If we see a cat in the movie, it would be pretty low fidelity if we heard it bark. But sometimes, messing with fidelity can be done for laughs. Who can forget this line? I don't want to talk about it. Or this scene. <laughs> Dad, what in the world is going on? Why are you stealing slippers? <laughs> hey, get back to the hospital. Low fidelity, but high comedy. And screwing with fidelity for comedy's sake isn't exactly anything new. After all, comedy is all about managing the expectations of your audience, and fidelity is how we measure how aligned with the expectations the media is. In fact, you can even mess with fidelity on a meta level. Like, what if you screwed with fidelity to screw with diegesis? Oh, here we go. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
Show with April in Paris, everybody. <laughs> so how many of you have never seen Blazing Saddles before? Yes! <laughs> Don't worry, the, the rest of the joke, the rest of the movie is, is just as funny. It's such a good, good movie. Of course, a high level of fidelity is what's expected, and most of the time it's what's delivered. One way to do this is by using audio effects to actualize the fidelity of the dialogue based on the camera's point of view. They have to do this because sound does not exist intrinsically in animation as it does with film or television, nor does it behave in the same way. In film, you can capture the ambient background noise and sound effects of an environment and all the different effects it has on the dialogue. Like if you're in a cave or, for example, in this room, the room is large and expands and the wall is far away and the speakers are there and you can hear the echo of my voice. You can do that in film and television, but you can't do that in animation. So what do they do? Well, for example, take the scene in season one, episode two. Sign me up! Just let me tie this bridge real quick, and then we have a deal. No! It's them or us. Rainbow! What's taking so long? Oh no. Rainbow Dash has flown Rainbow Dash has flown across the gorge to tie the other end of a bridge so her friends could cross safely. Twilight Sparkle calls out to her over the expanse saying, Rainbow, what's taking so long? Well, this was recorded in a studio. There's no echoey gorge in a sound studio. So DHX Media had to use effects like reverb and echo to add to the dialogue and bring to life the sense of distance and terrain that we see in the show to actualize the fidelity of what we see from our camera's point of view of what exists in that universe. Similarly, in episode four of season one, Pinkie Pie's voice was modulated, which means that the pitch was changed, as she was bounced up and down by the shaking ground caused by stampeding cattle during her line, this makes my voice sound silly. <laughs> Um, yes, yes, she is. Pipe down, you hippie. Now, there are ways distortion has been used to indicate a character's state of mind. Now, diegetically, this is done by temporarily placing our point of view within the chosen character. For example, in this scene, we get a better understanding of how exhaustion is affecting Applejack's mental acuity when she's receiving instructions from Pinkie Pie. All right, I'll get the sugar and the eggs. Can you get me some chocolate chips? Uh, uh, what was that? Chocolate chips. Chips, got it. <laughs> From our point of view, we very clearly heard Pinky say, as, Pinky asking Applejack for some chocolate chips. I mean, that's what happened. She wanted chocolate chips from the muffin batter. And in the real world, it came out fine. However, after Applejack asks her to repeat herself, we shift into her point of view, where we hear and see something completely different. Pinky's voice is slowed down and hyper distorted, cueing us into just how tired AJ really is. This is the kind of effect the manipulation of audio can have on a show's ability to communicate ideas within a narrative. It's one thing to say Applejack's exhausted, it's something else entirely to show you through Applejack's unique perspective. Of course, it's ever-present in this show as it was in classic television. Sound effects are also used as a thing called sound bridges. Now, sound bridge is, well, a sound that acts like a bridge from one scene to another. Episode 23 of season one gives us some very good examples of these. Let's have a listen. We can hear how she earned her cutie mark. 
Oh, that would be interesting. You know, I wouldn't have gotten my cutie mark if it weren't for her. Rainbow Dash? Really? Oh, yes. It all started at summer flight camp. You'd never guess, but when I was little... As a young filly in Canterlot, I always wanted to go to the uh. Summer Sun Celebration, where Princess Celestia raises the sun, and I saw the most amazing, most wonderful thing I've ever seen. So flashbacks like those are very often transitioned into with sound bridges. Uh, in that example, uh, Twilight, the scene talking to Twilight was brought in by the sound of a slowed down tone. Her actual flashback was brought in with a harp glissando, and Fluttershy's flashback was brought in with a piano trill. So obviously sound effects are a big part of the audio landscape of the show, but the music is just as important. One thing you will notice is that there's hardly ever purely diegetic music. For the exception of when Pinkie Pie is involved, because let's face it, when Pinkie's involved, diegesis goes straight out the window. <laughs> the only vocalized, purely diegetic musical numbers are the Hush Now Lullaby, Heartswarming Eve Carol, and Love's in Bloom. Okay? That's it! Throughout the entire series, only three songs actually exist within the universe of it. But what about all the other songs? Now, certainly there are songs where the characters are singing and dancing, and since they are actually singing and dancing, it can't be non-diegetic, can it? So what's the deal? Well, it turns out that most of the vocalized songs in the series are actually something called ambidiegetic. Ambidiegetic basically means it exists both within and outside the universe of the narrative of the show. And this is where we take our second trip back in time. <laughs> See, <laughs> for most of us, Hollywood is where we've had most of our experience with musicals. And it was from the 1930s to the 1960s when musical cinema was really in its golden years. Now, you may remember from earlier that cartoons with synchronized sound first came about in the 1930s, but general cinema with sound, or talkies as they said in my day, uh, got its first big push only a few years earlier. But why was musical cinema more popular then than it is now? Let's ignore Les Miserables for a moment. <laughs> well, it was a new medium. Before the advent of cinema, the primary form of live action entertainment people got was going to the theater. Like, in the actual building with stage and lighting and everything like that. Film was new, and studios just didn't know how to fully utilize this new technology. For the longest time, they would just put a camera in the audience, kind of like that one over there, or him. Hi there. <laughs> in the seating of an audience in the theater and film stage plays. But once they got more comfortable with cameras, that's when things really start to go up. We got stuff like an American in Paris, singing in the rain, and dozens of other great pieces of Hollywood history. You all need to see that movie. <laughs> now, before we go on, it's important to understand the qualities of musical music that sets them uniquely in ambidiegesis. And I think Phineas and Ferb explain it quite well. You know, Ferb, one of the best times we ever had was when we built that roller coaster. We should do it again, but this time as a musical. What do you say? We'll do all the same things, except we're breaking a spontaneous singing and choreography with no discernible music source. Hmm. What assurance would we have that everyone else would also break into song and do the same thing? I don't know. I think they probably will. Fair enough. I'm in. <laughs> so what songs in MLP exemplify this? Well, a few in particular come to mind. From season one, episode 26, the song At the Gala is an homage to Stephen Sondheim's Ever After. And it came to pass, all that seemed wrong was now right. The kingdoms were filled with joy, and all those who deserved to were certain to live a long and happy life. Ever after, ever after, journey over, all is mended, 
and it's not just for today, but tomorrow, and extended ever after. Ever after! All the curses have been ended, the reverse is wiped away, all is tenderness and laughter for forever after. Ah, uh, so oh, Sondheim, you musical genius, you. So, while the characters in that little clip, both the main and the background, are clearly aware of the singing and dancing, as you saw, there is no discernible music source. There is no orchestra, there's no nothing, they're just singing and dancing. From classic cinema, this harkens back to numbers like 16 going on 17 from the musical The Sound of Music, where they too seemed aware of their own musicality and choreography, whilst an invisible orchestra of ninjas lurked nearby for their accompaniment. Rarity's dressmaking song from season one, episode 14, unofficially named The Art of the Dress, is an homage to another Sondheim musical number. In this case, it's putting, putting it together from his Broadway musical Sunday in the Park with George. Thread by thread, stitching it together. Twilight stress, cutting all the patterns snip by snip, making sure the fabric falls nicely. It's perfect color and so hip. Always gotta keep in mind my pacing, making sure the clothes correctly facing. I'm stitching twilight stress. Note by note, working on projection. Uh -huh. Lips, teeth, throat. Looking for a moment to inhale Keeping the emotional connection Even when your fellow actors fail Pointing up the subtext by inflection Helping your director reach perfection Even though you have a strong objection To the way he's handling the direction Art isn't easy <laughs> In this case Rarity is the only one aware of the song taking place For the exception of the bridge When the five other ponies you know, join in for their respective parts Again, no discernible music source. These, as well as the This Day aria, are examples of how musical numbers can be used to provide information about the plot and the characters while not having to obey the restrictions of real time. The actions in the This Day aria and Rarity's Drift Making song take place over the course of days and hours, not minutes. Of course, how could we forget that the entire season three finale was one big musical? <laughs> you know, my only complaint, and I mean my only complaint about that episode was just how oversaturated it was with musical numbers. I mean, it was practically an opera. It was amazing. <sighs> All right, man, if you say so. <laughs> Season three, though, has given us something special. See, the song Babseed from the episode... <laughs> the song Babseed from the episode One Bad Apple is pretty unique. Let's take a look at it. So, now it's time for a little bit of audience participation. So, uh, I'm gonna need a volunteer. Uh, <laughs> ostensibly, yes. Okay, so um, you over there with the Rainbow Dash non-cat shirt, come on up here. Let's give him a hand. Okay, uh, so what's your name? Doug. Hey, Doug, how you doing today? Doing good, all right. So, got a question for you. Was that song diegetic, or ambidiegetic, or non-diegetic? 
<laughs> it's okay. It wasn't the, okay. Um, you understand what they mean? Diage okay. So diegesis means it exists within the universe of the show. Non-diegetic means it exists without, uh, outside of the show. And ambidiegetic means it's in a sort of fuzzy area in between. The second one. Uh, Non-diegetic? You're actually correct. All right. So, and it's, no, no, stay. Stay. Good. Now, not only, he's right. Not only is it non-diegetic, but he actually uses direct address as a storytelling mechanism with the audience. They literally look right at you and say, this is my problem. This is what's happening. And this is how they feel about it. This is the first time direct address has been used in the song, in the show. And while it is more of a technique of storytelling than of sound design, I felt that since sound design and storytelling are so deeply connected, it was worth bringing up. Now, for you, sir, for being the brave little soldier that you are, I have a prize for you. Oh, no, I'm not going for that. <laughs> I'm going for something a little bit better. Now, I'm going to show it to you first, and then I'm going to show it to them. Okay, you ready? Do you see this poster here? Yeah. You know why he gave a little oh my gosh at the end? It is signed by Tara Strong. Here you go, dude. Thanks for being a good sport. You have a great rest of your convention, whatever the rest of the day is left. Uh, the look on his little face. <laughs> Speaking of looks on little faces, would you get a look at that? Oh, how adorable are they? <laughs> now, another narrative aspect that makes this song distinct is that it's an example of a performance piece. Now, performance pieces are a hallmark holdover from the old Hollywood musicals, when you can really see their roots in traditional theater. I'm talking those moments in your Fred Astaire and Gene Kelly movies where they bust out full choreography and look right at the camera. These kinds of musical numbers have, been, have three common traits. Number one, they don't impact the plot. They are used primarily for introspection or exposition. And they are fully non-diegetic. The litmus test for this is if you can say yes to the following question. If this song was cut out of the movie, would it matter? In terms of Bab Seed, no, it's not. It doesn't matter at all. We know from the material in front and the, and the dialogue after it that, they, that Bab Seed is causing them a whole lot of trouble. You could slice out a full three minutes out of that episode and it wouldn't make a lick of difference. Non-diegetic also serves a key role in the show as mood music. Now, mood music serves to help indicate settings, characters, or emotional states, and even upcoming plot events. When, when Applejack or the Sweet Apple Acres Farm appears on screen, light banjos and guitars are heard to emphasize their countryness. Rarity's Boutique garners light strings in an orchestral piece to bring about an, an air of elegance and sophistication. And while Rainbow Dash performs her aerobatics, you'll be sure to hear heavy rock interludes accompanying her stunts. But sometimes mood music comes in the form of an homage. Yeah. <laughs> Let me say that again. Sometimes mood music comes in the form of an homage. See, no music exists in a vacuum. Uh, we, and this is as much true literally as it is metaphorically. All music is heard within the context of the music heard by the listener before. To that effect, since we marinate in pop culture, the music we hear is associated with shared is with certain shared cultural context. This is why Pachelbel's canon in D is so strongly associated with weddings or big ceremonies, because that's where we've heard it before. That is the context in which Pachelbel's canon exists in most of our minds. To evoke those same feelings, composers often create homages to those sorts of staple songs. In season two, we saw this when an homage to Yakety Sax from Benny Hill, played over, played over the scene while Fluttershy and Twilight were chasing after Philomena. In season three, we saw this. Okay, 
what you say about Blue Mom not getting in that carriage. <laughs> now, lest you think otherwise, or in case you couldn't hear some of your other audience members, that song is not the original audio from the episode. That was a theme of the 80s action show, The A-Team, and an example of a killer homage. My Little Pony, French Biz Magic, draws from cartoon sound history like Hanna-Barbera, as well as musical history from both Hollywood musicals and the musicals of traditional theater to create a soundscape that is reflective of its history and of the industry. Now, this fandom being what it is, whatever it is, um, <laughs> I'm sure many of you have heard some of those examples before. But for those of you who discovered something new about this show, I urge you to go out there and watch it with a new set of ears. If not to try and pick the scenes apart like I unfortunately do being so immersed in sound, then to get a better appreciation of the amount of work that goes into the show once the mics are put away and the voice actors go home. Thank you. So my name is Victor Frost. This has been My Little Pony. Sound is magic. Hope you all have a fantastic convention. And uh, bye. <laughs>